Hi, I'm Andrew Hilton. I'm the director of the Center for the Study of Financial Innovation, currently in virtual mode. We're trying to look at the sorts of issues that uh, we've been looking at in the real world, but in a, a virtual sense, and cover the same sorts of topics that are of importance to the City of London, to the UK financial sector, and to economists in general. And I'm delighted that we have a treat this morning, uh, which is Danny Alexander, Sir Danny Alexander, who is a senior vice president, a vice president at the Asian Infrastructure Investment Bank in Beijing. Um, he is, as you all know, a former secretary uh, of state for Scotland, a former chief secretary to the Treasury, a former chief of staff to Nick Clegg, and amongst other things on his uh, CV, he was the head of communications for the Cairngorms National Park. But in, I think, in, 90, in 2020, whatever it was, uh, he went to the AIIB, um, where he is responsible for a large amount of the uh, of the the institutions lending the AIIB has i think now 102 members it has a paid a paid in capital or callable capital i guess callable capital of 100 billion dollars uh, um and it is an extremely important multilateral institution focusing primarily on asia uh, the UK has, I think, 2.9% uh, of the voting shares, rather less than France, which is 3.2, and rather less than uh, Germany, which is also which is 4.2, and considerably less than uh, China, which, with Hong Kong, has about 27.5% of the votes. The UK is the US is not a member, and that's a contentious issue, uh, but it is it does have both out of area members and obviously Asian members. It has its annual meeting next week. The agenda for that is obviously high on Danny's, um, Danny's out front of mind. Uh, but let me first of all introduce my colleague, uh, Leighton Hughes, who has been looking at the AIB quite closely for uh, a lot of the last couple of weeks, and Sir Danny Alexander. Danny, uh, I, pass the, I pass over to you. What's, uh, what's your concerns at the moment? Well, firstly, thank you very much indeed for this uh, opportunity. It's good to have a chance to, to talk to you, and especially uh, with uh, a week to go to our annual meeting. Um, uh, we are uh, in the fifth year of the AIB, so still a, a relatively young institution, but already, I think, very well established among the uh, family of multilateral development banks. And uh, we were talking earlier, you yourself are uh, alumnus of the uh, World Bank, yeah, a young professional program. Um, and so very much, uh, you know, al along with the World Bank, the Asian Development Bank, the EBRD, AIB is taking its place as, as an investor with a particular focus on infrastructure um, to support the sustainable uh, economic development of Asia. And that's what we'll be focusing on next week. Uh, as with this conversation, our annual meeting next week will be virtual, the first time we've done it, uh, trying to join together our uh, 102 uh, approved members um, uh, to have a conversation around both the uh, immediate response to the COVID-19 crisis and also the long-term strategy for the development of, of, of AIB uh, in the context of what Asia needs to meet its development challenges over the next uh, next decade. I, I know um, that the theme for the annual meeting is connecting for tomorrow. And rather like the, the the World Economic Forum, it has a theme. It's it's a theme. It's a very broad theme, but um, it uh, it reflects a couple of things. Um, so, for AIB's investments, we have um, uh, three key priority areas: sustainable infrastructure supporting our members implementing the Paris Agreement, uh, connectivity, infrastructure that helps to support trade and, and connections between uh, our members and between the, the, the regions of the world, um, and mobilizing private sector capital, which is crucial because you mentioned our $100 billion of capital, where $20 billion is paid in, 80 is callable, compared to the multi-trillion dollar needs that exist for infrastructure in Asia and beyond that's a small amount of money, but we can, if we use it wisely, we can also attract a lot more private capital. So the theme is 
uh, connectivity, but also we, 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 we think of all of those things as, if you like, the infrastructure for tomorrow, you know, infrastructure that can help to tackle climate change, that can uh, build sustainable cities, that can uh, enhance trade and, and connectivity, and that can bring in private capital, um, and indeed that can also make the best use of modern technology. And so all of those things will be covered during our, uh, our, our webinar program next week. Uh, you and anyone else watching is, is welcome to join. You can register via the AIIB website at AIIB.org. And we'd be you know, very glad for anyone interested in what we're doing to join the program. Let me ask Leighton, you, you, you've been digging up some questions to ask Sir Danny. Yeah, uh, the, um, could you talk about how um, AIIB um, ensures uh, quality and sustainable infrastructure? Because, I mean, it, that's one of the things I've noticed, um, you know, the emphasis on sustainability and being lean, uh, clean and green, I think I read somewhere. Um, but is, is, there, is there a particular approach that you have to, to doing that? And, and do, you, um, do you fund coal-powered uh, <laughs> power stations, things like that? couple of tricky questions in there because I think up until recently over 50% of your energy investments have been fossil fuel based and there is so, a tension to shift I gather. Yeah so uh, I mean firstly the broader question then of focusing on the on the on the narrower area so you're right that uh, lean clean and green is the, uh, the kind of core values of, of what we're of, of the bank and what we're trying to to do and so in common with the World Bank or other multilaterals, we have a whole series of tests and standards that projects must pass before we can finance them. And that covers a range of areas, uh, you know, financial sustainability, uh, economic impact. Um, we want to make sure that we're financing projects that are really going to make a difference uh, in, the, in the members concerned. We look very closely at debt sustainability to ensure that the projects we're financing are not having an adverse effect on the debt dynamics, especially of those uh, those members who have a difficult debt position. Um, but in, in the context of, of the question, uh, we have very strict environmental and social safeguards. So we have an environmental and social framework. Um, every project is assessed against those, uh, against those tests, um, uh, as well as being in line with the broader strategy. So uh, in answer to your question about energy, uh, our board of directors, which represents all of our members, approved an energy strategy with a focus on investing in energy that supports uh, the energy transitions of our members towards more uh, sustainable power generation. Um, so in respect of coal, um, though that strategy leaves a very small space uh, where uh, in very specific circumstances in, in the least developed countries, coal projects could be considered. In practice, we have no coal projects in our pipeline. We're not looking for coal projects. I think it's highly unlikely that we would um, you know, see any coming down the, 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 the track towards us. Um, but in answer to your question, Andrew, the, uh, the, the, we, we've, we have made a number of investments in gas specifically, both gas power and also gas storage and uh, and and uh, gas pipelines in one or two cases too, um, and you know, in, in in many parts of developing Asia, that's an important transition. It's an important part of uh, for for those countries how they uh, develop their energy energy mix. So to take one example, um, uh, we we have a small number of projects in China, quite a small proportion of our lending, but one of them uh, was a project in Beijing, which was designed to support the the. Uh, objectives to reduce air pollution. Um, so that meant transitioning factories and villages in, uh, uh, in the Beijing area from coal to gas. Um, now that may not be your final destination, but it's a very important step along the, uh, along the journey. And so very definitely we finance projects in that sector, but equally we have solar power, we have a number of hydroelectric uh, projects, mainly upgrades and repairs so far, but could be uh, new projects in, in, in future um, uh, wind is, is part of our portfolio too. So, uh, we're, you know, in energy, we're looking across uh, the whole range of investments we can make. Also, in electricity transmission and distribution infrastructure, if you can improve the efficiency of a distribution system, then you save a lot of the systemic losses, which otherwise just demand more power generation. So I think in all those areas, we can make a, 
uh, a difference by choosing uh, good projects in, in our especially low and middle income members. Mm. Tell, tell us a little bit more about the beneficiaries. Where uh, the the mix of beneficiaries? Who gets the money um, from the AIIB? So we have uh, so far approved lending of just over 19 billion US dollars in our first four and, and a half years. Of course, I think now 23 of our of our members. Um, India is uh, substantially the largest uh, borrower. Uh, more than 25 percent of our financing has gone to projects in India. Um, uh, actually, South Asia in general is an important market for us. So India, Bangladesh, Pakistan have all been uh, significant uh, borrowers from the bank, but also others like Indonesia, Turkey, um, uh, Egypt has a number of projects there. Uh, we have, a, as I mentioned, a couple of projects here in China, um, but also in, in some of the smaller and lower income countries. Nepal, we have a couple of projects, uh, Cambodia, Laos. So. You know, as, and as time goes on, you know, one of our objectives as we're quite carefully building this new institution is to be able to reach, uh, reach new clients. I think the other part of it, though, is also um, that we want to build up not only the, the, the government lending, the sovereign lending, uh, but also to be very active in the private sector. Um, so you know, eventually, um, you know, we'd like to build a substantial proportion of our business in the, in the, in the non-sovereign sector, whether it's uh, loans, equity, uh, capital market initiatives. Um, so we have a number of funds that we've invested in, for example. We have some capital market projects designed to encourage the development of more sustainable capital markets, especially green finance uh, in, in, in Asia. So we see that as a space that we can get into. But I would also just add that, of course, over the last few months, uh, much of our business has been directly related to the emergency response to the current crisis. So we set aside up to 10 billion US dollars for a crisis response facility that could finance emergency health lending, uh, budget support, um, liquidity support for, for, for institutions. Um, we've already what committed... Terms? Was that on standard, uh, standard bank terms? On, on our standard terms, yes, that's right. Um, on our standard terms, with one exception. So it's, it's actually it's a point of difference between the AIB and other multilaterals. We don't have uh, concessional financing. We don't, we don't have a grant program like IDA or the ADF of, of the Asian Development Bank. Um, we do have a small special fund for project preparation, which um, has benefited from contributions from the UK, from China, from Korea, from Hong Kong. Um, and... We agreed that we would use some of that money to have a special interest rate buy down package for uh, the lowest income member countries, basically the IDA countries. Um, and so uh, uh, that, that, that makes loans, I think the first one was approved quite recently to the Maldives, um, specifically for crisis response at a lower rate of interest. But otherwise, all the lending is on the standard terms, yeah. You, could you talk a little bit about to what extent are you involved with the Belt and Road Initiative? Well, the, the Belt and Road Initiative and the AIB are, are completely separate things. AIB is a multilateral institution. We set our policies and our direction according to the views of all the members as expressed through our board of directors. So Belt and Road is an important initiative of, of, of China. Uh, they're, um, as you said, the largest shareholder, but they're one of uh, 102 approved members, all of whom have a say. Um, furthermore, um, as I mentioned in answer to the, to the earlier question, uh, we will only finance projects that meet certain, certain tests in terms of economic sustainability, financial soundness, uh, environmental and social safeguards, but also other areas like competitive procurement, um, and the other safeguards that you would expect on the issues like corruption, for, for example. So when we're looking at a project, which and the projects are brought to us by our member countries, if they're sovereign, or uh, by private companies, if they're, if they're non-sovereign, we're looking at, against, uh, looking at them against those tests. We're not looking at them against, do they have a certain label? Are they belt and road? Do they carry a blue dot or whatever it may be? Uh, we're looking at it solely on the merits of the of the of the project from an, from an economic perspective, and so um, uh, while the the Belt and Road Initiative uh, may well bring forward more projects, um, more connectivity related projects, we will only finance projects if they meet those tests, um, and if 
if they can be overseen and implemented in a way that that, that, that meets our internationally agreed policies. Um, and I think there's a role also for multilaterals, including the AIB, in acting as advocates for high project standards, mm -hmm. um, for good governance, for strong environmental and social safeguards, for um, the ability of project-affected people to uh, raise concerns about the way projects are being run, these kind of things, um, which, you know, for, for us, uh, headquartered here in Beijing, is, is, is an important part of our role, just as it is for, for other multilaterals, wherever they happen to be. Well, what do you, sorry, sorry. Leighton. Uh, what do you think, are, what are the greatest infrastructure challenges uh, that you see in Asia? I know there are obviously quite a few, uh, but I just... Uh, well, that, if, if, if you're moving on, let me just go back and ask a question about that, about the Belt and Road Initiative. But, mm. So you have avoided the problems that the Belt and Road Initiative has had in terms of debt sustainability. I mean, um, you have, I think, co-funded uh, some of the Belt and Road Initiative projects, but with your procurement rules and if you have satisfied yourself that this is sustainable on a longer term basis in terms of the debt burden that, that countries are taking on, that everybody obviously looks at Sri Lanka and the problems that the Sri Lankans have had with the Belt and Road Initiative, but it's more general than that, isn't it? Pakistan and other countries. So in respect of debt sustainability, we look very carefully at that issue for every project that we finance. And actually, we, we cooperate very closely with the International Monetary Fund. We have an information sharing uh, agreement with the IMF. Um, you know, our project teams, when they're visiting projects, will talk to the IMF representatives on the ground um, and follow very carefully uh, any, uh, any guidance that they have in their Article 4 assessment or another information that they, that they share with us. Um, and of course, that's also why it's important that we invest in projects which have, um, you know, strong economic rationale, where, there's, where there are clear development benefits that will, in due course, help to enhance the economic development and the GDP of the, of, the, of the country. We don't want to invest in white elephants. We want to invest in projects that are really going to, uh, to make a difference on the ground. And that's, you know, that, that's, that's, for all NDBs, you are with the World Bank, that's a crucial part of how you ensure that the, the taxpayers' money from the members that you're investing is making a genuine impact on the ground. Yeah. Leighton, your point. Yeah. Uh, what, are, what, what are the greatest um, infrastructure challenges um, in Asia that you see? And there are obviously, um, I mean, you, the, you, you can see um, in, in, in Jakarta how crowded that is, uh, just anecdotally. I mean, it, how can, how, how, what are the challenges in setting, setting things up? Um, I mean, the challenges are enormous. Um, and I mean, look, of course, Asia is a very big place. So, so generalizing is, 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 is hard to do um, because each, 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 each country, each market is different, has, 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 different, has different challenges. But if you want me to, to, to generalize, I'd make a couple of observations. I mean, one is urbanization. So over the next uh, 25, 30 years, something like a billion more Asians are expected to move into cities. Um, so that will be new cities, it will be existing cities that, that will have to expand. And you know, ensuring that those are places that, that are livable, where people can get around easily, uh, that where, which are environmentally sustainable, that have basic services for dealing with water, sanitation and so forth. You know, those things are you know, incredibly important both for the lives of the people who live there and the, the broader agenda, especially of environmental, but also economic sustainability. So that, you know, that's, that's one example where, you know, the sorts of things that AIB can do can be pretty helpful. So, uh, you know, we have projects that are investing in uh, urban transportation, for example. Um, you know, the metro in Bangalore, uh, uh, light railway in, in, uh, um, uh, in, in, in Mumbai, you know, other such projects in cities elsewhere in, in the world. Uh, we're investing in, in and supporting development of, of, of water treatment and sanitation in cities in Pakistan, for example. Um, so, you know, that would be one area. I mean, obviously, um, there is a there is a you know basic economic development challenge which is absolutely enormous. So um, 
uh, you know, there are there are more than half a billion people in Asia who don't have access to 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 regular access to mains electricity, for example. Um, the climate challenge is also uh, is is extraordinary, and you know, with with most of the world's population and um, you know an awful lot of carbon emissions, also then. Um, investing in a way that can, you know, make a transition to to, uh, to to greater environmental sustainability, whilst you know still um, supporting the economic development, which is essential and which people uh, rightly expect. You know, that's also a huge challenge, and a lot of that is felt through through infrastructure. We were talking about power generation earlier, but also transport infrastructure is 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 crucial in that respect too. I think there's a really important issue here. I mean, you've got basic infrastructure like water availability. I mean, or water is obviously a major problem in, in quite a lot of the countries which are your members. But you also, right. I noticed for the annual meeting, you talk, a major theme is the digital divide. So you're, you're effectively defining infrastructure as everywhere from water and bridges to, uh, to internet access. Uh, I think and that's I where true. where yeah. the priorities are at the present time. Or so I think you're right. I mean, of course, the term infrastructure is, is is very broad, and so we have to focus on certain areas that we that, that we've identified as being um, at, at really priorities. Um, so, in terms of environmental sustainability, particularly energy and urban infrastructure, are are, are, are crucial. Um, connectivity, especially transport, roads, railways, ports. Um, you know those things are very uh, uh, important. Um, I'm sure we'll come back to the topic of mobilising private sector investment into infrastructure uh, later in the conversation. Uh, but also, but technology is crucially important. We see in 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 how different societies are dealing with the current crisis. Just how important technology is. We wouldn't be having this conversation without you know both of us having access to the, the decent technology to do so. And so. The, 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 the digital divide, whether that's related to hard infrastructure, such as access to, 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 to broadband or basic telecommunications connectivity, um, or whether it relates to soft infrastructure, is, is, a, is, a, is an enormous issue in economic development. Um, so, for example, uh, we've financed in Oman uh, the rollout of a broadband system. We've financed fiber optics um, uh, 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 in in Southeast Asia, you know those kind of things which help. And I, I grew up in the Highlands of Scotland. I was a member of Parliament for Inverness for some time. You know, even within the United Kingdom, these digital divides are a, are a huge issue in terms of which parts of the country have access to to digital connectivity and which don't. And it has a a, a a real impact on the sorts of things that you can do, the sorts of economic activities you can engage in. And so, um, when you look at Asia. There's a huge variety of access, not only between urban and rural, between rich and poor, but also, you know, some some of our members have well-developed telecommunications infrastructure; others much less so. And so, you know, for, for you know, we don't want we're not there to crowd out private investment, but where there's a need, we do see a role, yeah, for for AIB to be part of, you know, investing in the infrastructure that can help to tackle that problem too. You brought up uh, the private sector involvement. I mean, you and you also said you don't have a an an IDA equivalent. Do you are you going to set up an IFC equivalent? Or and let me ask you to broaden that out a little bit. The role, what can the City of London offer to the AID, AIIB in terms of access to markets? And what kind of response are you getting from the City of London? Um, so, firstly, we're not going to set up an IFC equivalent. We intend to do public and private investments on the same balance sheet rather than separating into two. We think that that offers certain advantages, um, you know, not least with sub-sovereign investments um, where you might be dealing with a mixture of private and public or municipal and, 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 and private. So, uh, uh, from, this, from the same balance sheet. Um, I mean, I think the City of London has a, has a lot to offer. Um, so we've, uh, I mean, in a range of areas. So firstly, as you would expect, we've been active in uh, raising money through bond issuance. Um, uh, we, we just relatively recently issued our second dollar benchmark bond. Uh, both of those were issued and list, were listed in London. 
Um, and that will continue. Uh, that, that will that will certainly continue to be part of our our, our fundraising strategy. Of course, yes. Um, you know, London has not an exclusive role, but an important role to play in 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 in, in that sector. And London-based institutions are, uh, you know, very much part of our uh, part of our thinking in the in the in the future. But also, I think increasingly, um, London can be uh, both a source of deal flow. You know, many deals can be put together. You know, involving institutions based in, in London as well as in other parts of the world. Um, and then this, this. So, so we have a we have a broader agenda, which is much discussed and, and, and not unique to AIB. I think it's 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 a it's an agenda across a lot of uh, market participants to say that uh, in order to really mobilize private sector investment, you need to be able to take emerging market infrastructure from being a, a, something which is invested in on a project by project basis to develop it into an asset class that can be invested in as, as, an, as an asset class. But much discussed in, in the city of London, Douglas Flint um, in, in, in his former and current roles has, has talked about this a lot, for, for example. Um, you know, we see that as as a as a core kind of long term objective for for AIB to, you know, so if, if we can achieve if we can be part of achieving that objective, then you you will um, help to open up infrastructure in Asia to a much wider range of investors than those who would currently consider it at the moment. Um, and when you're looking at uh, According to the Asian Development Bank, perhaps a 26 billion, sorry, 26 trillion dollar need over the coming uh, decade and a half. Then an awful lot of that will have to come from the private sector, which means um, making uh, the, 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 the asset class investable to pension funds, insurance companies, and so on, as well as those players who already know the infrastructure sector very well. And so. Um, you know, that's part of initiatives that we've been taking um, a, a project in Singapore, which is uh, in, part, in partnership with an organization called Clifford Capital and the Singapore government creating a warehousing facility that can take a large number of infrastructure projects from banks and then um, put them together into instruments which allow people to invest in uh, the, the asset, like a CLO, invest in the asset class more generally rather than in the specific project but also we have a sustainable capital markets initiative which is looking at um, uh, ESG bonds um, uh, Paris alignment in, uh, uh, in, in in climate bonds and we see those kind of initiatives as helping to develop markets in Asia that perhaps don't exist at least not to the same extent as they do in Europe for example and Obviously, London is a centre of expertise in many of these sectors. Not the only centre of expertise, but it's a major centre of expertise. And so, I think the city can uh, can, can play a significant role. And I, to answer the third part of your question, uh, we have a lot of engagement um, uh, with 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 the city, with whether it's with the City of London Corporation, the London Stock Exchange, um, uh, and, and 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 individual firms, and certainly. Um, you know, whenever I'm in London or whether, whenever President Jin's in London, we have a lot of a lot of those discussions. Um, more virtual at the moment than physical, but um, uh, you know, it's an important part of how we of how you know. Th well, those issues are important to the development of AIB, and there are plenty of opportunities for uh, market participants, whether they're based in London or in other financial centres, to get involved. Um, as we said, talked about earlier, we're very transparent and open in terms of how we're working. And look, also our door is open. So if um, there is a, a company who's a project sponsor or a bank who's originating a project and they feel that AIB could, could be uh, appropriate as an investor, they can come to us, bring the project to us, and we'll examine it in, in the way I described earlier and respond quite quickly. But in, in terms of um, private sector involvement, I mean, you must be looking with big eyes, I guess, at the pension funds in Asia itself. I mean, Asia has an aging demographic. India and China are going to have enormous uh, problems. They, they must grow their, their pension systems and they must take uh, they must invest long term for, for that. And presumably that has to be a source of, uh, of funding for you going forward. Um, I think it certainly can be. Uh, yes, absolutely. 
Um, I mean, of, of course, for our for our uh, uh, for our funding requirements for our bond issuance program, um, you know, we're we'll issue in a number of currencies. We'll issue in a number of jurisdictions. We listed our first panda bond uh, earlier this year. Uh, so, of course, we want to tap into different markets. And as we um, develop financing in local currencies in, in, in many of the important markets, such as Indian rupee, for example, then uh, you know, we'll have to develop um, uh, operations, there, uh, operations there too. Um, but in addition, I think we, not only for our own investments on our own projects, but trying to uh, see how uh, infrastructure can be structured in a way that it's attractive for those players to, to invest in for themselves, not just in AIB finance projects, but more generally. I think, I think that's an area where you know, the, the right kind of projects for AIB can help to catalyze um, uh, uh, good developments. So what that's what's behind this, this, this Bayfront project in, in Singapore, for example. So, uh, what about the impact of the non-participation of the United States? I mean, the United States has obviously taken a sort of hands-off view. Um, does that affect procurement? Does that affect the kinds of projects that you can do? Or, or is it just something that you've put to one side? I mean, it doesn't really, to be honest. I mean, so, for AIB, I should, I should have said at the start, you know, our procurement is universal. It's not limited only to companies from... AIB members. So, uh, and, and the same is true with our recruitment. So we have US nationals working here in our headquarters. We have, um, you know, American firms who take an active part in some of our activities, you know, banks, financial institutions, this kind of thing. Um, and so, uh, you know, those relationships are, are good on a commercial level. Um, if, a, if a, you know, US companies can compete for procurement opportunities in AIB finance projects as much as a British one can or a Chinese one can for that matter. Um, and, you know, as time goes on, you know, we'll see, I'm sure, more of that kind of uh, participation. I mean, I remember back to when I was Chief Secretary to the Treasury and, and um, you know, George Osborne and I in particular were looking at the case for uh, UK joining the AIB. And, I mean, you'll remember there was a little bit of skepticism, if I can put it that way, from across the Atlantic about this proposal. And, um, you know, the, the questions raised then were about, you know, is the AIB really going to be a high standards international institution or is it being set up to somehow undermine the existing uh, architecture? You know, we took the view that um, we thought this was a, an attempt, a sincere attempt to create a genuinely multilateral institution and by taking part, we could help to ensure that it was developed in the, in, in the right way. And I have to say, you know, over the first five years of the bank, it's absolutely lived up to our expectations. And um, I mean, I'm now part of the bank rather than looking at it from the UK perspective. But in terms of what we were, were looking for then in terms of governance, standards, partnerships with other multilaterals, um, you know, AIB is doing... Um, exactly what we wanted and hoped. And I think a lot of that scepticism has now been laid to rest as a result. And do you, do you, when you talk about cooperation, obviously much of your cooperation has to be with the Asian, um, <laughs> the Asian Development Bank, the ADB. Um, yes. But Correct, you, yeah. you work very closely on, on the pipeline of projects with the ADB. Right? So, um, so we, work, we work very closely with the ADB. And in fact, in the... Uh, in the in the COVID crisis, particularly, we, we've been working very closely with them um, because for AIB we wanted to provide budget support or policy based lending instruments to our members, but we don't have the capacity to do that by ourselves. So we said we would do it only in cooperation, either with the ADB or with the World Bank, and in practice, so far, mostly with the ADB. It's been very, and, and we've got a very good partnership with with them. We've also we've co-financed many projects, actually more projects, with the World Bank. Uh, but also some with the EBRD, uh, with the European Investment Bank. And so um, we've had, you know, really good support, also built very strong partnerships with a, with a range of other multilateral institutions. In the early stage, that's helped us to learn, but it's also, um, it's also of necessity. When projects are very large scale, having multiple financiers to share the risks is just common sense. I mean, it, there is a perception, obviously, from the outside that the 
AID, AIIB is a Chinese dominated institution. The ADB is a Japanese dominated institution and there the two shall come together. But in, in practice, it doesn't work like that. I, I, quite the opposite. I think from the, uh, you know, from the leadership through to the operational level, there's, a, there's very strong uh, uh, partnerships. Um, you know, both in, the, the characterization of both institutions is in, incorrect. They're multilateral institutions. They're part of the rules-based international system. Um, and that creates a very strong basis on which cooperation can take place. You know, the, 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 the way we think about projects, the sort of standards that we apply um, are, I would say, functionally identical. There are small differences, um, but functionally identical. So, for example, if we're co-financing a project with the ADB, um, we don't have to repeat the environmental assessment that they've already done. If it covers all the issues that our policies care about, we can use that as the basis to go to our board for approval. You know, that's, that's something where you can enhance your efficiency and build a good partnership. Leighton, do you have a, want to come in here? Uh, so I, the, um, the international coordination um, aspect is really interesting in this current environment. And do you see the, I mean, it sort of touched on it already, but the east-west um, dynamic is um, sort of under a bit of pressure at the moment. And I was just wondering, as... as Given what you've said about AI, AIIB um, being, you know, reassuring about quality and independence, um, you don't see any sort of pressure on the uh, organisation, or it, it's there's no pressure in terms of uh, funding. It's or everything is smooth and business as usual. Look, we're absolutely carrying on with our business as usual, and I don't see those kind of those kind of issues. You know, in a sense. This is one of the reasons why I believe that multilateral cooperation is very important because you establish these institutions on the basis of laws. You know, we're set up by an international treaty. Um, as, uh, we're, we're, um, which is registered with the United Nations. We are governed by our members uh, collectively. And therefore, you, you have a framework of cooperation where there's a common objective which all the members have agreed on. Um, and so the, 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 the politics doesn't need to get involved. It's about, you know, have you found the good projects? Which direction do you want to go in? What should be the strategy in this particular uh, 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 sector? You know, in our board of directors, all of the members are, are, are represented. China has one seat out of 12. There's a, there's a, a French director, there's an Indian director, and so forth. Um, and so... Uh, really, we operate very much by consensus among um, among that group. I think the I think the interesting, uh, more interesting part is the economic impact on our region. So every year we publish an Asia Infrastructure Finance Report. Uh, I say every year, you know, for the last two years, um, and one of the things we look at there is, uh, you know, what's the outlook for. Uh, infrastructure in the major infrastructure, the eight major infrastructure markets in, in Asia. And it, in both uh, this year and last year, we saw a, a downturn in private sector investment in infrastructure in the region, which was uh, at that stage put down to uh, particularly uh, some of the uh, uh, trade and geopolitical tensions just depressing some of the appetite for, for investment. So that's an economic fact that we have to contend with. Um, but actually, in a way, it, 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 it almost reinforces the importance of the role that multilaterals can play, operating counter-cyclically, thinking for the long term, building partnerships with your, with, your, with, your, with your clients and your borrowers. But, you know, very definitely, I mean, this was before COVID, obviously everything changes as a result of, 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 of COVID. But before COVID, we did see, um, to some extent, uh, in, in many parts of Asia, some downturn in, in private investment in, in, in infrastructure. And so obviously that's something where, you know, our, our private sector uh, investment is designed to catalyze more private investors having the confidence to come forward to support some of the projects that are needed. Clearly COVID is going to have an impact on your portfolio. I mean, uh, particularly in poorer countries that are only now, if you like, being hit by the, the virus, but will suffer this uh, blow to remittances, blow to um, 
exports sort of triple whammy that they will they will be hit with. What is your position? I mean, the the World Bank and the IMF have always taken this position that they're somehow above any kind of debt rescheduling talks. I mean, what is is you have been lending on standard terms to relatively poor countries. You must expect that there is going to have to be some sort of restructuring of that at some stage, at least in some of the countries. Um, so we we take an approach to those issues, uh, which is very similar to those of other uh, major multilateral development banks. Um, the, the the preferred creditor status, if you like, is part of the operating uh, operating model. We have a AAA credit rating, which helps us to raise money very cheaply uh, in the in the markets, and that's a benefit that we can pass on to our members. In response to the crisis, our uh, our, our approach has been to really step up the the amount of financing that we can provide and the range of areas that we can provide financing to beyond what we would normally do. So uh, our crisis response facility, which uh, we set aside 10, 5 to $10 billion, but can be more if necessary, you know, is financing healthcare, something we hadn't, we hadn't got involved in before. Uh, as I was saying earlier, uh, making budget support lending uh, available Though that's not something AIB would do in normal times, but in a crisis, it's what our members need. So we want to respond quickly to, 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 their, to their needs. And so I think we see that as the, as, as the role that we can play um, in response to the crisis, is bringing finance, you know, more finance forward to, to those members who need it. Um, and, of course, as you'd imagine, there's a yeah, huge demand um, you know, we've improved, approved in the last what two or three months more than five billion dollars of of of, uh, of of lending in health and in budget support to quite a wide range of, of AIB members, and there's much more in the pipeline. And so, you know, that's if you like, that's really our our our, our focus. We're not going to change our business model, but we we, we absolutely have to step up and uh, and and support you know our members in a time of crisis. But particularly with lower income countries, lower income recipients of funding, they do face this uh, terrible problem, commodities, exports, uh, remittances, the collapse of, of their markets. I mean, it's going to be a very tough time for the least developed Asian countries, is it not? And it's not just the Maldives, which everybody No, no, no it, uh, I think your analysis is, is right. It's an enormously tough time. I mean, each, each member is different, but the, the, the economic picture is... Is very difficult, you know, in, in 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 all parts of the of the region, and I think you know we've been working very much in concert with other multilateral organisations as part of a kind of coordinated international response to the uh, to the crisis. And I think um, you know we're, we're as as you implied, for many countries they're still in the emergency phase of the response, uh, but the next phase will be about how can we support the recovery. You know, what are the what are the kind of areas that that uh, that we or other institutions could support, which can help to, 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 to aid the kind of economic recovery which, which will certainly be wanted and is highly desirable. Mm, yeah, but when they have debt ratios of 120% of GDP, that's the biggest problem they face. Um, uh, coordination, you talk about coordination amongst multilaterals. Is that through the G20 or is, uh, where is that coordination taking place? And a sort of final question on the international architecture. Are you comfortable that... Uh, that there is sufficient coordination for the challenges going forward, not least those ex- aggravated by the coronavirus. Um, so the, 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 there are regular meetings among the MDBs to talk about, um, you know, the kind of support we're providing. Then there's, bio, you know, as you know, each institution has the same kind of, if you like, general objective, but we all have very specific and different mandates given to us by our members. So we're, Focus on infrastructure. We don't have concessional financing. Others have a different remit. They have different instruments. And so, what we want to try and make sure is that that the uh, each is playing to our strengths, so that the overall package of support that, that members can access if they need it is covering all the different uh, needs that they have. And 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 there are very regular conversations at at, at, at all different levels. Um, you know, obviously. The, the 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 geopolitical circumstances are very different now to, to that which there were in two thousand eight two thousand nine. On the other hand, in two thousand eight two thousand nine, international institutions were, were were strengthened through through a lot of the decisions that were made then. And so I think there's an increased burden on the institutions themselves to cooperate with one another, 
and to identify the 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 the, the, the right ways forward. I, I certainly see um, a lot of commitment to that cooperation, um, you know, among all the institutions and across the board, and that's a very good thing. And what can the UK government do that it isn't doing at the present time? Do you feel that you're getting sufficient support from London? I'm not going to go into uh, policy choices that the, the UK might make, but I'd say, um, tempting though it is, uh, uh, but I'd say that the UK is, is very committed to the AIB, strongly supportive, a very active participant in our um, in, our, in our in our discussions, and we're very grateful for that support. <laughs> On that happy note, well, let me just ask you one question. Put yourself two years ahead. Where do you see Asia um, coming out of the crisis? Where do you see the the main uh, business of the AID, A, A, AIIB? What what will it be doing two years from now? Will it be back to normal? Will it be a new normal? <laughs> Unfortunately, it's almost impossible to predict how this current COVID-related crisis is going to unfold. Um, but I, I hope um, that uh, you know across the region, countries will be um, uh, in you know well into a, a strong economic recovery and um, uh, you know focusing on addressing their development challenges. And for AIB, you know that means particularly focusing on uh, sustainable and climate-related uh, investments. Um, uh, but also in the other areas that I, that I that I mentioned. So obviously, in the immediate response, we are we are focusing our resources on 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 responding to the to the to the crisis. Um, but you know, actually, if you like the the kind of business as usual activities, those core investment themes are really important for the long term development of the region. So I hope that we'll be. Um, I hope for our, for all of our sakes, this uh, this crisis will be. Uh, as short-lived as possible. But that is not a prediction. But unfortunately, it's impossible to predict, but it's certainly a hope. Yeah, it's a hope we all share. Can I thank you, Sir Danny Alexander? Uh, can I thank my colleague, Leighton Hughes? And can I thank all of you for watching? Many thanks. 